You know what a technology, it never changes? It always changes. <laughs> I had you there for a minute. I had you. You're like, what's this guy talking about? Oh, this man. technology actually changes because technology always has to change. Hmm. That's why it's technology. Mm -hmm. What a roundabout. Damn. Strange Damn. vortex we just went through in the first sentence of today's show. It's too late for this. It's 5 p.m. <laughs> Late for Will is 5 p.m. If we're, if we're shooting at 5 p.m., Willie does a whole different, Old man. a whole different guy. Vivo is making a phone that has color-changing rear glass. Yeah, uh, I don't know why. Yeah. It, it, you gotta have everybody's got the cool finishes. What's the coolest finish? A finish that is never finished. It's ongoing. Yeah, it's it's always it's a work in progress. And uh, and and it's everybody's reaching for that next. All these manufacturers are reaching for that next kind of a marketing component that this this thing you can point at and say, "Here's the reason you need this new smartphone. Here's the new cool thing." Everybody's reaching, and I'm not mad about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's exactly what this thing is, right? That's what that's how you innovate. You can't be satisfied. You got to keep changing. But it's just kind of funny sometimes to see. These little uh, incremental yeah. kinds of developments, and you try to process it and figure out how big of a deal it is. I think it's cool. Maybe other people are watching this and saying, I don't get it. What's the big deal? But you can see the video up here. Willie Doo's got it. Uh, it goes from like a bluish to, a, and it's not one of these things where it's reflecting the light. Uh. It's one of these things where you actually press a button and it's using some kind of electromagnetic. Let's see what they call it. Electromagnetic glass mm. to achieve this dazzling effect. Apparently, this was used on a OnePlus concept phone a while back. I don't recall that. Was that CES 2020? I don't think I was there. It, uh, there's an electric signal that causes the glass to switch between being tinted or transparent. So what you see in this video, the full tint is like a dark bluish purple. And when the button is pressed in the other direction, it goes translucent. Now, it's not a case. By the looks of it, it's it's actually the backing of the phone, I suppose. Could it be implemented in a case? Maybe. Maybe we got to step up the later case game hmm. and have the color-changing cases. Yep. It sounds very complicated. And it would have <laughs> yeah. to be expensive, so I don't know. It would be tough. But... On a phone, maybe you could justify it, the world's first color-changing phone. You want to be blue one day, mm. and you want to be uh, white or transparent the other, or who knows what variety of colors you could utilize this uh, technology to achieve. Mm. You're not going to see it in an iPhone anytime soon. No. But Vivo's, Vivo and Oppo, they're always bringing some next thing you didn't know right. anybody was working on. Yeah. Good on them. So you got to appreciate different it, things, yeah. you know, it oscillates between white, deep blue, and a brief glimpse of a gorgeous lilac purple tone. Lilac. Yeah, that's right. Well, get it together. You got to get that lilac phone going on. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, speaking of iPhones that are not going to have electromagnetic color changing, instead they'll have five... G in the form of millimeter wave. This is a follow-up on a story from the other day. We were talking about how, how not all 5G is created equal. You have the sub-6 gigahertz, slower stuff, but more widespread. You have the shorter distance millimeter wave stuff, which is, oh, baby, gigabit territory. It's the stuff that gets you going, Will. It's the stuff that will wake you up at 5 p.m. in the evening, even though you haven't had dinner yet. Mm. It'll get you right back in line with the show with your usual energy level. Yeah, second wind. <laughs> uh, apparently, though, this new report suggests that the only iPhone that's going to get this millimeter wave technology is the top dog. And I'm not talking about every top dog. I'm not talking about every pro iPhone. I'm saying just that Max model. Oh. I'm saying when they get the, like, 1500 bucks out of you or whatever it yeah. is. Then you get the millimeter wave. And the reason being is apparently these millimeter wave setups, they have a very specific antenna layout that requires a little bit more space as well. So not only do you throw into the expensive model, because it's going to cost you 50 bucks a unit is the estimate to put the millimeter wave in there. 
So you got to get some of that money back on the premium model. But then you also need the space. And you know what else you need, Will? This, this stuff, this millimeter wave stuff, it sucks battery. Drinks it. Hmm. Just chugs battery. So maybe you slap a slightly better battery in there as well. Now, the other part of the report is that this millimeter wave 12 Pro Max may only show up in iPhones destined for the United States, Korea, and Japan. And uh, part of that has to do with the the actual millimeter wave footprint on the network side and the fact that it's not even available in a lot of locations. Right. So I don't see Canada on that list. I don't yeah. we don't we don't have that millimeter wave going right now. It will be interesting Maybe to we kind did. of uh brand this um as like the best five G. If they say that? Yeah. I know because it's the millimeter wave thing doesn't really make the case, does it? Yeah. There's so many 5G devices, but, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Somebody has to let me know. Do we have any millimeter wave carriers here in Canada? I, June 5th, Canada postpones critical 5G spectrum auction by six months. That's June 5th, 2020. So we'll have to wait and see on that. But anyways, you can see for the time being, that model may only pop up. United States, Korea, and Japan. Uh, we've shown some speed tests in the past. This millimeter wave stuff's for real, close to a gigabit connection wirelessly. It's incredible. But in order to get it, according to this report, you may have to step up, spend a bunch of money mm. on an iPhone 12 Pro Max. Mm. TCL, company makes t TVs, a lot of displays, things like this. They got a new display technology, which is somewhere between an actual uh, typical LCD display and an e-ink display, but with color. It's somewhere in between the two. They're trying to save your eyeballs, Will. You're getting all strained. You're doing the late night reading. You're staying up too late. And, and you're looking at the screens and the bloodshot eyes. Yeah. You're doing damage. Every night. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing damage, yeah. man. It's Yeah, it's hard, man. It's really hard. Yeah, put it down. Put the device I down, Will. Anyway, so I don't know if you ever mess around with an e-ink display. but yeah, They're great. So the thing about them, they're reflecting light, right? Whether it's daylight or whether it's a lamp or something, you're, you're, that's why if you turn the lights off, you see nothing on the e-ink unless you have a backlight mm. on some of those. But because of that, it's a sort of more natural, more ambient thing. It's less of a retina burn. I mean, am I explaining e-ink to people? You understand. It's less eye fatigue when you're reading for long periods. Maybe you use the... Check the ringtone, by the way, real quick. You see, that'll get you in the right mood. That's a stock ringtone on a stock Samsung ringtone. It's kind of wild. It'll just chill you right out. Uh, everybody knows when you're reading for long periods of time on something like a Kindle, there's advantages to the e-ink. Well, the problem with e-ink, it's pretty low tech, man. It's just black and white in most cases. And, and it you know, has some limitations for as far as details concerned and things like this. So advantages and drawbacks. I remember we did an e-ink smartphone at one time. Yeah. How about that for the notifications? <laughs> Anyways, a lot of people have been trying to figure out the color e-ink thing. And you were looking at an article the other day. I saw people, read, they were reading the Marvel comics with the colored e-ink. And that's a pretty cool look. What this TCL one, they claim it's even better. On the TCL one, they claim it's going to operate a lot like an LCD display. But, but, but a lot of the light that shows up on the screen is actually going to be reflected from the light source in the space, which is then going to give you a much healthier eyeball experience, supposedly. Uh, better eye prote protection by reducing flicker, blue light, and light output. The company said the effect is similar to e-ink, calling it a combination of screen and paper. So they're targeting tablets and e-readers, and uh, they say compared to e-ink, this version will offer 25% higher contrast using a highly reflective screen to reuse natural light it'll also be thinner than a typical lcd about 36 percent thinner so uh, e-ink has some drawbacks right now when it comes to trying to enjoy multimedia content as well mm. uh, you can't you try to throw a video on there i mean it's a, it, the refresh the whole thing is re it's a disaster so they're gonna bump up the refresh rate uh, typically e-ink devices refresh at very slow rates making it difficult to enjoy videos or animations 
If TCL's NXT paper does support smooth video playback at a respectable frame rate, it would be noteworthy. So I guess they didn't say for certain what they're going to do with that yet. But if it is a true merging of the technologies, maybe. Mm -hmm. In which case, now you can save your eyeballs at night, Willie Do. Mm -hmm. uh, Intel, they put out a bunch of new stuff. Tiger Lake. They got some chips. And funny enough, you look at the, you look at the image there. They're showing off their Tiger Lake stuff against iPad Pro 12.9 and Surface Pro X Qualcomm. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to, I think they're trying to showcase how small it is here. Mm -hmm. Funny enough, Apple moving away from Intel, you, you know that's why they picked that iPad Pro 12.9. Because mm -hmm. Apple's like, we don't need you anymore, Intel. And Intel's like, hey, we can shrink stuff too. They do look similar. They look very similar. Mm -hmm. But you, you'll never, I don't think, arguably, yeah, I don't think you'll ever see Tiger Lake inside of Apple products because by that time they'll fully have shifted over mm -hmm. to the Apple Silicon stuff. Anyways, they showed off a bunch of benchmarks. They, uh, I mean, it's pretty much what you expect. It's improvements across the board. They also talked a little bit about relationships with uh, software developers, uh, specifically a, a very tight relationship with Adobe, showing tremendous performance improvements within Adobe's various applications, including uh, um, Adobe Premiere, Photoshop, Lightroom. There's all kinds of sophisticated AI stuff that is uh, is benefiting from that relationship of working together, kind of like a cheat code, Will, where AMD's sitting there saying, we didn't get that special treatment. Mm. Not that the, the, you know, the average customer is going to have to take this into consideration. Now, they may have advantages in specific software if they opt for a particular chip. The other thing that was uh, mentioned was there was a lot of time spent on what they used to call, I guess they used to call it Project Athena. This is the idea that there would be a certain specification that a laptop would would have to meet to be considered, uh, it, to meet Intel's criteria for what, an, I don't know, they don't call it Ultrabook anymore, but, but Intel's criteria for battery life, for uh, certain performance metrics and things like this, so that people could go out and pick one of these laptops and know mm -hmm. that it would at least be solid enough to get that, designation right but i don't know if they're changing the name apparently now the newest branding is called evo and there's going to be a bunch of laptops available requiring a core i5 or core i7 cpu intel's marketing is trying to frame tiger lake as more of a way to achieve the whole system user experience that athena and evo guarantee so it's a weight. it should be a certain weight it should it should have a certain amount of battery life. It should have a certain amount of performance. And then uh, an individual going in to buy a laptop knows, okay, cool. I sort of know what to expect, and I want to pick one from within this hmm. within this range. So better stuff from Intel, and they're not going anywhere. I, they lost a big customer in Apple, but hey, competition. Who knows? Maybe they work a little harder. I don't know. We'll see. Qualcomm, on the other hand, they're 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 it's it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a merging going on uh, thing here with computing where you have the traditional proce processor manufacturers like Intel shrinking stuff down, trying to get into, I mean, they kind of gave up a lot of their mobile business, but they're trying to get into more mobile, more portable devices. And then you have companies like Qualcomm who are dominating in the smartphone space and they're trying to get into laptops and Surface products and and tablets. And it, it's the the processor wars are upon us we're talking about everybody's competing mm -hmm. for your for your they want to be your horsepower whether it's Qualcomm Apple Intel AMD I mean you name yeah. it so Qualcomm's got this 8CX Gen 2 5G processor for arm based laptops which is an upgrade on uh something they announced I guess 2 years ago they got started on this they've got a new version of it here and they've also shared some benchmarks about how they think it can go head to head with 10th generation core i5 products and uh i mean they're not they're not going to put it up against the latest stuff just yet obviously it's all too fresh but they're showing performance improvements and you can see lower power consumption as well 7 watts uh again leaning on that background in mobile devices where you got less you've got less resources at your disposal from a battery life perspective you got to get that stuff down so it is curious to see uh Qualcomm's approach to scaling their stuff up and, and the other brands approach to scaling their stuff down. The new 8CX Gen 2 
is apparently going to give you a full a full day a full day's worth of work on a single charge. They claim 25 hours of continuous use or uh, multiple days of battery life, depending on what you're using it for. This in a laptop is very exciting if it comes to fruition. Will mm -hmm. we would love to see that take place? It's uh, the new model is also going to have Wi-Fi six. Bluetooth 5.1, a couple of other performance improvements, to, uh, support for dual 4K external monitors at 60 FPS. It's going to have 5G in it as well. Uh, of course, that's Qualcomm's background backstory, so full connectivity. And, it, and you start to think about this millimeter wave stuff, you start to, start to think about an always-on, always-connected device in the form of a laptop with a fast connection not tied to your Wi-Fi. Things get exciting, Will. Mm -hmm. I can tell. Try to, uh, try to keep it together. I can tell you're very excited here. That's right. Uh, next up, we have a commercial here from Apple that uh, I think it was kind of a fun commercial, but it also was a little bit irritating for me watching it. Uh, it's a privacy commercial, which is what Apple's really into. I don't know. Can you show a little bit of it? Just show a little bit of it. I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure Apple will fully support us. Do you have to? Is there uh, music there? There's no music. I don't think. I think it's just like a soundtrack. I mean, I can narrate it if you prefer. I'll give you. I love working with you. Me too. Red okay, you can mute the audio now. I'll give you. The, I'll give you everything you need to know. All right. Everybody is shouting the things that they would normally do privately. Everything from I just searched this, I just did that, to another guy who's running and he's like, my heart rate is this, my heart rate is that, uh. and then the the girl who, the, who you saw working in the office over there is saying. Oh my God, I don't like that guy that's sitting right behind me. And then they're also spelling out a bar face emoji. And mm -hmm. they're saying everything that you would typically type into your device. Mm -hmm. And the culmination of the thing is some things are meant to be private. Use an iPhone so you can be private. All right? Mm -hmm. You got the rough idea there, Will. Yeah. That's the commercial, but it's very well done as Apple would do. You know, they spent money, they hired actors, and they did the whole thing as you would if you were Apple. Privacy, look at this, that's iPhone. And then at the very end, you have the Apple logo with the lock on the top. And everybody's trying to get in touch with me right now because we're shooting too late in the day. Yeah. Anyways, so main thing here, Will. Hmm? Main thing that bugged me. Yeah. Everything they're talking about, like from the very beginning of the of the video uh, of of the guy, I googled whatever I did last night, or not saying Google obviously, but yeah. I looked up whatever. That has nothing to do with your iPhone. Mm -hmm. If that dude's on, it could it, be any phone. He's using, but he's using Google, right? What what search engine is he using? Apple. So you're not protecting him from being tracked by Google, are you? Mm. If he has a, any kind of Chrome sign-in, or unless he's opted out of absolutely everything, it's weird that the commercial makes it seem that everything you do on your iPhone is diff or is different than the things you would do on your other computing devices. Hmm. That it somehow is treated specially. Now, obviously, if you're using, say, iMessage, then then Apple has a tremendous amount of control over that experience. Mm -hmm. But they made it seem as though the things that you're Googling and search, they made it seem. They didn't say it exactly. Right. And that's that's the thing about it. You have to take it for what it is. And they're trying to make a point. And I, so I understand that. Talk to the broad audience. But you're going to get an iPhone. You're going to boot up Google. You're going to get an iPhone and load up Instagram. You're going to get an iPhone and load up Facebook. And they're going to start tracking you yeah. right away. Apps that are not controlled by Apple. Absolutely. That's how all the ad targeting works. How do you think when you load up Instagram on iOS, you're getting all those ads that know everything about you? Hmm. Apple did nothing to protect your privacy in that particular exchange. Now, that may change over time. They may become stricter about how those services operate on your iPhone. But for the time being, I would just say that to the uninformed individual watching that, they may get the impression that Apple's controlling more about their smartphone experience than they act actually are. Hmm. So anyways, I just will, you know. I'm not one of these guys. I'm not man. just one of these guys that just wants to hate on it. Like, oh. I know what they're trying to say, and I actually think it's kind of funny and, 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 and kind of well done the way they did it. Oh. I just got to put that out. Mm -hmm. Twitch will now let anyone host an online movie party with Amazon Prime Video Library. Oh. Did you ever consider something like this? Will you have an online movie party with um, your pals or, or, or whoever you're streaming for? How would that work? 
So here's how it goes. Twitch is owned by Amazon. Yeah. Bezos. Uh-huh. Good old billionaire Bezos. Mm. He's got this huge Prime library. He's got all these streamers. It's all wonderful and beautiful, is it not? Mm. So he's sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute. What if we make the Prime library available to the Twitch streamers so that they, that, that, that that counts within whatever licensing agreement we have with these different content providers or even our own content that we shot? And I mean, that Prime stuff, they own it mm-hmm. in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. What if we made it possible for Twitch streamers to use all that stuff copyright free mm. and just stream watching it it would promote the content it would get more amazon prime subscribers more views the streamer gets more views they're happy because now they can use content they previously wouldn't have had access to Mm -hmm. will he do so i guess uh with these uh stream parties yeah um people will like gather in like a twitch stream or something yeah that's right all the the video will be like synced yeah the video will be synced you all gather in there, and I guess your favorite streamer can select what they want to have a watch party for. And you're lonely. You're at home. You got nothing going on, anyways. And and all of a sudden you <laughs> you want to watch. Hey. No, I'm saying, man, you don't want to watch everything alone all the time. Yeah, yeah, I know. And you want to watch with some other people, so you hop on there. And it's one of these weird things where you have these mega corps, and everyone's always complaining about the mega corps because it's like they control too much. But here's one of these weird circumstances in which. They really can tie some things together that previously would be very difficult to do to watch hmm. that caliber of content collectively together. And I presume that the Twitch streamer can also earn revenue from it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an amazing and strange combination. Now, it's not as perfect as you might want it to be. So, for example, they have their own licensing issues depending on where you happen to be located. So you do, you will have to be a Prime subscriber in the same region as the content do you see what i'm saying here all right so if you're in the u.s it's a u.s show you have complete access to and your prime subscription carries over to twitch you remember people were using their twitch prime stuff to sign up for amazon prime so their favorite streamer could get that subscription fee kind of like that but the content will matter they they there's a an example cited here in the article suggesting that something like Star Trek Picard isn't available in the United States Amazon Prime Video. It's in the United Kingdom, for example. It has a different it has a different licensing deal in the US. Hmm. So if you try to boot that one up, you got a problem. Hmm. So there are some complexities to it, but I just more wanted to talk about it as a cool idea. Yeah. And particularly because non-gaming content on Twitch and non-game streams is growing substantially in popularity. People looking mm-hmm. looking to hang out, man. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. There you go. YouTube is trying to get you to create more stuff, though. That's what they're interested in. They're going to completely reconfigure the app and put a really big, prominent create button down at the bottom. And if you scroll down, I mean, the screenshot really does all the work. I think you're going you're gonna to have a take on this, Will, because you're always interested in design and things like this when it comes to the interfaces. Mm. The and, UI? Yeah, that's your background, Will. You're an expert in this, so you can tell us if they screwed up or not. So here's what happened. They took the notification portion from the lower bar and moved it up to the top where the create button used to be in the form of the little camera-looking icon on the top bar and now instead Mm. down on the bottom bar probably in the most prominent location in the entire interface is a big plus button which is used to create Mm. and create of course means to shoot a video that you're going to publish to youtube youtube loves content they want all your content yeah however youtube is a bit intimidating creating on youtube you feel you have to prepare the things maybe even edit the things yeah maybe even have a show like this and then you press upload you wouldn't you're not pressing the thing right away now they changed a little bit when they put the stories in there make it a little more fluid i don't know i'm just going to share this event or something mm. but still not to the level that some of the other platforms have encouraged people to create who previously weren't creators platforms like tiktok hmm Platforms like TikTok may seem so simple to make right. something that you just hit a plus button. So the suggestion here, the thinking is that that create button is actually a precursor to YouTube's new TikTok competitor called Shorts. Uh. 
and that everybody's going to be pressing this create button real soon. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're priming it up. Um, Have they got you primed, Will? Do you feel primed? No. Not at all. You're not that, uh I mean, this is on Instagram as well, having like that uh, camera button right in the middle. It's uh, very... Stressful. Nerve-wracking. Yeah, it stresses yeah. you out. I mean, I'm like I'm not much of a creator. I don't really post that yeah, much. Yeah, 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 yeah. So having it there... Uh, yeah, you can see why they're doing it. It's a bit intimidating. You can see why they're doing it. I don't think the youngsters are are nearly as stressed out as we are. So for them, it's like, so what? It's just a create button. Mm -hmm. But I hear you. It's almost like it's yelling at you. Post something. Post yeah. something. Hurry up and post something. You're like, geez, I'm just trying to chill. It's also bigger, the button. It's huge. It's a massive button. And it also diminishes the notification button by putting it up top. So people are going to use their notifications less. But I'm pretty sure YouTube doesn't care about that because they want that home feed algo all day. Mm. They want to pick what you want to what you're gonna see big time. Uh, Elon Musk says settlers will likely die on Mars. Will oh. I, I can't say I'm surprised. We we've, we've known this. There was a he was doing a he was at a recent conference on Monday. How does he find time for the conference? You know. Yeah. And he said that the first Mars settlers have a good chance of death. And I suppose he's right, whether it's immediate death, death after a couple of months, or just death because you're not coming back. Yes. It's a heck of a trip. Once they finally get to the point of doing this thing, it's going to take maybe a year to get there. It doesn't stop people from signing up all the way back in 2013. People have been signing up to go to Mars. To, they don't, they're saying, look, if I, uh, maybe I die, so what? I'm a guy, I went to Mars. Yeah astronaut requirements <laughs> there's many things that are that could kill you there well many things it's uh obviously it's cold it's not the most welcoming place mm. they're gonna have to figure out ways to get resources there uh, interestingly there's some uh, some ideas about getting raw materials there and using things like 3d printers and chemical processes to turn those raw ingredients into many things instead of trying to ship everything there, which might not be feasible. Mm. So they're looking for raw materials and then equipment that can transform those raw materials into the making the necessary components for life on Mars. Are you going or no? Uh, after, after some really successful launches for a couple of years, yeah, yeah I, would, I would go. You'll check it out. Well, here's a quote from Elon Musk. Good chance you'll die. It's going to be tough going, but it will be pretty glorious if it works out. Would you go? Yeah, yeah, I'll go. You'll go? Okay. No, I'm not going to go. Oh, Jesus. 